Thank you, Chris. In Jesus' time, when a new ruler uh, won a great battle, or when a general won some kind of victory for Rome, and they got back to Rome, or to whatever their capital was, and they went to go sit on their throne or their, pl their place of power, they had something of a speech that they prepared earlier that they would say to their subjects, especially if you were conquering new ground. So if you were bringing the power of Rome into a new territory that hadn't before been under Rome's control, then the general or the commander, or sometimes the emperor Caesar himself, would either say these words himself or have them read on his behalf by a messenger. It would go something like this. All authority in this place is now mine. I am now your Lord and Master. I will keep you safe. I will fight your battles on your behalf. And you will be my subjects. So whenever a new ruler took over new land or won a great battle, there was this speech in which there was something of a transaction, something of a, I will do this and you will do that element. Now look again at our reading today and look at what Matthew is doing when he puts these same words in the mouth of our Lord. The 11 disciples go back to where it all started. Galilee, Galilee of the Gentiles, there, that place that nothing good can come from, John will tell us. They go up to the mountain, to the place where he commanded them to meet. Some of them have doubts, others are fully committed to the resurrected Christ. Jesus says to them, all authority, not in Galilee, not in Judea, not in Samaria, not in Athens, not in Rome, but all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. This is Jesus taking his place as Lord on the throne. And now hear the commissioning. The next slide, Rayleigh. This is what you will do. Go now and make disciples of all the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. That is what you will do. And this is what I will do. I will be with you until the end of the age. Friends, we worship the King of heaven and earth. And this time we are in now, the season after Pentecost, is also called Kingdom Time in the church calendar. It is a time in which we come together as a church to say truly we do worship the Lord of heaven and earth and He has a particular commandment, a commissioning for each of us as individuals but also as His church gathered together. We are to go out into the world. And an image that has always helped the church understand its role in this time, in this place, is that of a boat. The church being sent out of the safety of the harbor. You could say out of the safety of the church building itself and into the world. Sometimes onto calm waters, sometimes onto stormy seas. But this is the time that we are now in. We have received the great comfort and the great forgiveness of the resurrection of our Lord. We have now been through the event of Pentecost last week where we re re received again the power of the Holy Spirit to go out and to do these things. Now the commissioning, now the mission is leave the church. Leave the harbor. Yes, it's a wonderful place. It's got a beautiful stained glass window. And the people are wonderful. But don't stay here too long. And don't stay here too much. Don't get too used to being in the harbor. Because that is not what ships are for. Go out into the world. And now the question the church has always had, um, and rightly so, 
is, Lord, but what are we to do out there? Jesus says, well, it's simple. Make disciples and baptize them. And don't, don't baptize them in your own name. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then there's that warning in the end as well. And teach them to obey everything I have taught you, not just the parts that you like, but everything. Now that commandment, baptizing them in the, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, is so important to who we are as Christians, that in the Reformed tradition, we celebrate today Trinity Sunday. Well, I shouldn't say that. The whole church, the Catholic Church, celebrates it as well today, Trinity Sunday. But in the Reformed tradition, it is the only festival of the church that is not tied to a calendar event. So we have Christmas and Easter and Ascension Day and Pentecost and all the rest. And all those are tied to the seasons of the church. But in the Reformed tradition, Trinity Sunday is the only festival that is dogmatic. We're saying this is not tied to a calendar. This is not even really tied to a story in Jesus' life. This is tied to how we understand God as Father and as Son and as Holy Spirit. Now, when you're studying theology, um, people will often tell you Trinity Sunday is a preacher's nightmare because uh, you can never say enough and you're always saying too much and it's so multifaceted and so dynamic and so complex and the ex-ministers are all bobbing their heads saying yes, yes, yes. But you know what? It's not supposed to be that difficult. And by that I don't mean that it's easy to understand the Trinity. It certainly isn't. But if we only save it for one Sunday a year, we'll never get the hang of it. Every Sunday is Trinity Sunday. Every proclamation of God's word and truth is the Trinity working, speaking, moving. God the Father sending forth the Son. God the Spirit emanating from, resulting from, being breathed out of that relationship between the Father and the Son. I once had a lecturer say to me, uh, to truly be the people of the triune God means you must have at least three answers to every question anyone ever asks you. <laughs> Don't be content with looking at things one way. Because God himself is three persons in one, working in three connected but different ways in every single facet of our lives. Now, that might all be true, but of course, that doesn't really help us understand the Trinity any better, does it? Um, John writes in his Gospel, and he gives us perhaps the greatest clue there is. He says to us, he wants us to remember, God is love. Now, if you look at every other religion in the world, in some way, shape or form, they will say, well, yes, God has love. God can love. Somehow, in some way, love is an attribute of God. And that, that's all plain and simple. But the Christian God, friends, is the only one of which it is said, not he has love, not he does love, he is love. It is what defines him. He can't help himself but to be that love. And in a roundabout way, it is love and that love of God that helps us understand what the Trinity is. Because... When you love, you are the lover. But if you don't have something to direct your love towards, what happens to it? Where does it go? Is it even love? And so there is always a lover 
and a beloved. Yes? But then between them, there has to be something that makes that love travel and channel and connect and work and grow and deepen. That shared love. And so, so many times, Jesus himself will speak about being the beloved of the Father. The Psalms will tell us about the beloved of the Father, telling us the Father is the one who loves. He is the lover. The Son, Christ Jesus, is the beloved. And that thing they share, that shared love, that love that corresponds and mirrors between them, that is the Holy Spirit at work. So there's a, so there's a Catholic theologian, uh, Fulton Sheen, who has an even better image for this. He says, the father, the lover, is seated at his throne and he is looking upon the face of his son, Christ Jesus, the beloved, that perfect, unblemished, resurrected, fulfilled divine identity. And when he looks upon the face of the son, all he feels is love. And when the Son, the Beloved, looks upon the face of the Father on the throne, and all of its majesty, and all of its glory, then all the Son feels is love. And then when they look at each other, <sighs> there's this sigh of love, there's this there's this breath of love. And of course, you will know from the Old Testament that the word for breath and the word for spirit is one and the same word. The Holy Spirit is that breath of love that the Father and the Son cannot help but exhale. And in that exhaling, it comes and it lives and it breathes among us and it gives us life and breath and it gives us love. And ultimately, friends, it is what strengthens us to be those who get in the boat and get out of the harbor and go share that love with the world. It can be no other. As disciples of Christ, we must reach that point where we say we don't love because we think we need to. We don't love because we think there's a reward for us at the end. We love others, neighbors, enemies, in fact, because we have no choice. Because we look upon them and we sigh that same love of God. Now, the best way the church is always known to do this is by coming together to share the body and the blood of Christ. So, communion team, if you will please join me and take your places around the table, um, and we will go into uh, the act that has forever symbolized, yes, thank you, the love of God, not just that love which God shares, but that love which is also dispensed onto us. Yes, I think if we have four on one side and four on the other will be golden. Surely, if you would help me with the cloth.